Major markets around the world are selling with the S&P 500 down 0.72% which had Twitter in a tailspin. Bears are calling for the end of days and bulls are shuffling to buy protection. So in a market currently driven by emotion, your edge is being cold, calculated and unemotional like an algorithm. So today I bring you a sense of reality and speak only to the facts and the stats. We're going to talk about why we're selling, how long it'll go on for and provide you with the key levels to navigate this volatile time. And something else no one else is talking about is the economy. Part of the reason we're selling is based on a stronger economy and today we're going to dive into the key economic indicators to provide you a bird's eye view of the entire US global economy. We're also going to talk about sentiment, yields, gamma, and much much more we've got a lot to talk about so let's roll the tape welcome everybody to the daily recap show where we talk about stocks and the financial markets my name is chase if you like this video please subscribe hit that notification bell like this video and leave a comment for the algorithm let's get into it guys so a pretty red day across the board except for the leaders in pretty much every sector energy did really good but look at meta green right look at um salesforce look at uber uh, the leaders here in software application nvidia less of a decline than all of the other semiconductor names same two Year with Microsoft. Look at Lilly Healthcare, but most of healthcare got actually hammered. Despite the other defensives, telecom services, utilities posting Green Day, the reason being had to do with, I believe, Medicare rates. The government set Medicare rates a lot lower than the market was expecting, and that's why it was an absolute bloodbath in healthcare plans. But we did see drug manufacturers do pretty good. Look at Visa, look at MasterCard. Okay, the leaders in each sector were positive, so it was like a, a rotation into uh, great businesses, great companies, or defensive rotation into energy utilities consumer defensives right other than that red across the board so we definitely are seeing a liquidation and a defensive rotation just getting into a higher quality names and more defensive names here in the market and looking at sectors as a whole look at the top performers energy gdx for those of you that don't know my top two performing sectors for this month are both up like 3% now doing really, really well. Guys, and my models really, really work. And you know what's crazy? I built these models in 2022 in a down tape and I didn't really know if they were gonna work in an up tape. They did in 2023 and they're working in 2024. I've called the top performing sectors for January, February, March, and now we're going on April, kind of crazy. But then we also saw green here in utilities, metals mining, everything else was red, including comm services, uh, materials, industrial staples as well. We also saw stuff like technology red red day in this down tape same with software the worst performing sector here was home builders regional banks and healthcare here because of the medicare rates and the reason why stocks were down today it was just a continuation of yesterday uh, people saw yesterday as just a bit of a sell-off two days in a row makes it like a okay this could get serious especially higher yields impacting stocks and then we saw that defensive rotation take place but let's actually hop on the charts and have a look at everything in detail okay before we dive into the s p 500 let's look at the majors Every single major index, SPX, NDX, RSP, mid caps, small caps, IWM, each and every single one was down, guys. And, you know, down 0.72% here for the S&P 500, a pretty rough day. Futures overnight is red as well. Look at the ES, look at the NQ. RTY, slightly positive. We did have increased volatility on the day. Look at Bitcoin up 1% in after hours here. But if we actually go in on the day, this is the weekly chart. Let's hop on the daily chart. That was today's candle down 6% and looking really great right now for Bitcoin. I think they really need to put in a higher low above this level right here. They can do that, break above this high. The uptrend will then continue from there. But if they go ahead, break this low, then break this low, it's probably, you know, down here to the 52 handle, 52,000 handle for Bitcoin. And let's have a look at what gold's doing today as well. It just continues marching higher. Doesn't look like we're seeing any signs of exhaustion. These are pretty big candles. Today's candle was uh, not that big, but this is after hours. This is a uh, gold future CFD, by the way. And then we also have um, the dollar is actually moving higher, but not in after hours, but it is pumping higher on the daily chart. Kind of crazy when you look at that. That's not really good for stocks and the Fed don't really want that. They don't want a strong dollar. They want a weak dollar. And that's really what's causing this market to sell off. It's a mix between, you know, yields moving higher, the dollar moving higher and strong economic data. That's really what's pushing this market down at the moment. But let's actually dive into the S&P 500. Now, a couple of things I want to show you guys. Remember here, 5202 is a weekly line in the sand. You know, we're bullish above here and we can get bearish below here and we actually did see price discovery below but what actually happened was we found quite a lot of bulls come in at these levels right here 5180 5184 and i think we could actually look at this as being the low of the week i think maybe even look to 
to potentially this level right here, this level, this level right here, and maybe this wick. Those are the two levels you can look to. So let's say 5170 for tomorrow. We get like price discovery here. Uh, if we don't get below these levels, I think we're probably going to move higher into the end of the week, you know, bait out some shorts, get some weak shorts here and then squeeze higher. I think that's what's going to happen. But if we start pushing down into these levels right here on volume, that's where it's going to start getting really, really ugly. And then we're going to actually just maybe look through sitting through the volatility. That being said, we actually closed at 5205. Our line in the side is 5202. So on a technical basis, based on positive gamma and our trade plan, this being the gamma flip zone, we couldn't get materially low below the gamma flip zone. And remember, I did say there's a lot of positive gamma at the 5200 level. Go check out yesterday's video. So we could see material buying uh, to the upside here. If we do start to see a push up uh, during normal trading hours into these levels, potentially getting to the bottom of this wick, we could really then see a further push to maybe the close right here, the open as well. But right now, let's take it day by day, guys. And we're looking at two levels, 51.84 below. And then we're going to start looking at maybe a downside for the week sitting through volatility. If we do start to form like a base right here, I think it's we're going to go higher from there. So that's what I'm thinking with regards to the S&P 500. Just updating you guys here on the S&P 600. Uh, in the weekend video, we said this is the key Key level we want to hold. I mean, the RTY is positive in after hours, but I do think that we could probably see a flush here to the 1270 level in the RTY if it doesn't find support immediately on the open. Uh, yeah, I think we could probably flush all the way to this level, and this is the next big level where it needs to find support. The thing is, when yields rise, small caps dump. They're just really shitty companies. 40% of them are unprofitable. Mid caps looking a tad stronger, very similar to the S&P 500 at our daily level. What really needs to happen is either they need to find a good strength early in the session tomorrow or they are going to move down here to the 29 29 level and that's the next big level to hold but those are the charts those are the key levels stay safe out there guys and just remember sit through this volatility we get three to four five percent pullbacks in the year one ten percent pullback every one year so if we do get the ten percent pullback better late than never and we're just going to use it as a dip buying opportunity because we look at all of these charts look at these weekly charts guys this is bullish you don't want to fight this tape look at the S&P 500 that's a very bullish chart and we take the volatility as it comes it's the price we we pay for the returns we do get in equities now looking at sentiment guys just yesterday we were at 72 we were right here on the edge of greed extreme greed we're now closer to neutral than we are extreme greed and so you see the market has pulled back in a very material way from a day ago and even a month ago here at extreme greed and if the sell-off does continue in the way it has with yields going up gold going up we're definitely going to see this move closer to the neutral and possibly into the neutral territory so guys a, a massive massive sentiment shift here although do take into consideration we are still in greed and we have come up a lot a pullback is to be expected now looking at fed's gdp now we got the latest gdp now data we ticked up here to 2.8 percent GDP expectations for the first quarter of 2024. Kind of crazy when you think about that. The consensus expectation is two. And this came up after we got that great ISM PMI manufacturing data yesterday. It ticked up all the way to 2.8%. And as a result, we know what happened. Yields rose and rate cut expectations. The probabilities of a June cut, July cut are slowly moving away into the September period. Now we are still expecting a 56.3% chance of a cut year in June. But but we are starting to see greater probabilities being priced into September. And I do think if we do get great employment data, we're going to see the very first cut happen here on the 9th of the 18th, 2024. That's September 18th. And that could bring material weakness to the S&P 500. But all pullbacks should be looked as dip buying opportunities because you're essentially getting a cheaper S&P 500 in a stronger economic backdrop. That's literally why rate cuts are being pushed out further because the economy is stronger. I'd buy hand over fist S&P 500 if we do get lower prices. Cheaper S&P 500, better economy. I'm buying hand over fist as a result. Guys, at the same time, we're seeing GDP increase, a stronger economy, right? Yields are increasing, yet the spreads between 10-year uh, treasuries and investment grade bonds have not changed at all. And this is pretty much telling investors that the economy is strong and that credit risk remains low for top rated issuers. Have a look at this right here. Uh, the strong negative correlation between IG spreads and the 10 year treasury yield has remained steady so far in 2024. Higher rates, tighter spreads. And having a look at the spreads, AA corporate bonds against treasury bonds barely moved after the data we got this week. The same is true here for uh, BAA bonds, so pretty much like mid tier corporate bonds. 
actually some of the lowest levels we've ever seen. I showed you these charts yesterday as well. Credit spreads haven't moved. Credit risk remains extremely low. The bond market is telling you that there's nothing to worry about. And if we do get a pullback in the S&P 500, we should just look at it as a dip buying opportunity. We can start getting worried when credit spreads start to shoot out. Remember what happened here in 2022? Credit spreads started to shoot out. That was your short signal right there. We haven't seen that yet. And if that does happen, I will let you guys know. So go ahead, follow me so you don't miss a beat. But as it is right now, there is absolutely nothing to worry about. Yes, yields are rising, but credit spreads are tight and the bond market is telling you everything you need to know. Now, while large caps are probably going to be largely unaffected by yields rising, small caps, that's where the issue remains. Okay, look at the interest coverage ratios of small caps. Two times a beta over interest, most small caps make, okay? Which means if yields rise, this goes down very, very quickly. A lot of companies could be bankrupt. It's a lot healthier for mid caps and extremely, extremely healthy for large caps. And we can also have a look right here. Currently, this is the current level. 42% of small cap companies aren't profitable. That is crazy. Compared to mid caps, 20% and 10% here uh, in large caps. And look at what it was during COVID-19, 2020. This is about three and a half years ago, three to three and a half years ago, 32% of mid cap companies were unprofitable, 20% of large cap companies. These big names have really shored up their balance sheet, made their business model significantly profitable. And we've seen a, a, a material decrease. That's a 50% decrease in mid caps, in mid cap companies that are unprofitable, right? The same is true here for small caps. At the same time, the S&P 500 has rose significantly from COVID-19 to where we are right now. We're looking at an 80 a 90% increase in the S&P 500, very close to 120% increase uh, in the NASDAQ 100. So yeah, companies are a lot healthier, but that doesn't mean that rate cuts can't affect these smaller cap companies and maybe some of the more uh, volatile debt laden mid cap companies as well. That is the economy. That is the stock market. Let's talk about the consumer. So the consumer is actually in a very healthy position. And I do think any increases or extended pauses in the Fed funds is not really going to affect the consumer. You could see a, a total of 176 trillion in total total assets, 20.5 trillion in total liabilities. The majority of that liability is a mortgage, which is essentially just equity, right? Most people pay their mortgage. Mortgage delinquencies are very, very low. And that leaves the American consumer with $156 trillion in net equity. And look at the debt household service ratio, 9.9% at historically low levels going back to 1980. So debt payments as a percentage of disposable income is only 9.9%. And I saw some very interesting data from Redfin. I think something like 30 31 or 34 percent of new home buyers were buying their house in outright cash, which again just adds to the health and the strength of the consumer. Now, looking at to flows into early delinquencies, stuff we're seeing is orders at 7.7 percent, not at 2008 09 highs, but still pretty high in the last 10 years. Same is true with credit card, but we look at student loans and we're at historically low levels. I did mention this when we looked at the JP Morgan Guide to the Market series uh, last quarter's version that I was expecting this to tick up and that hasn't happened yet. And that's why we're seeing debt service at 9.9%. If student loan delinquencies do tick up, that could be an issue. But what, something we're also seeing is a lot of student loan forgiveness. Joe Biden has been forgiving not a lot of student debt, but he has forgiven quite a bit of student debt. So I think that's also leading to this ratio being very, very low. But that being said, we have to look at the data as it is, not as we like it to be. And right now, a household debt service ratio of 9.9% is very healthy, as well as 156 trillion in total equity assets minus debt. And look at this equity, guys, 8% in deposits, right? And then 42% in other financial assets. So these are like highly liquid, right? So they can get these pretty much immediately. They can get these within like one to two days. So 50% of consumer assets assets are liquid within like probably a week, they can get access to that money. That just shows how healthy and how strong this consumer is and how strong the economy is right now. And looking at consumer savings. So yes, the savings rate is the lowest ever, but that's because people are making more money and disposable incomes have never been higher. At the same time, excess savings is still sitting at 0 0.8 trillion, 800 billion. Now it's well off its peak, but I do think that a lot of this excess savings is just going into money market funds. That's something we're seeing. And that's why this is being depleted down. And this is excess savings. Once your excess savings are depleted, you just go back to your personal savings. And then secondly, looking at inflation adjusted growth by deposits in income quartile, you can actually see that deposits are actually increasing across every income quartile, except the zero to 20% income earners here. But deposits actually increasing throughout the fourth quarter 2019 to third quarter 2023 with an average increase of 7%. You know, consumers, they are saving money. They are making money. They're all employed. The unemployment rate's really, really low. Low income debt ratio. The 
consumer seems healthy, the economy seems healthy, American companies seem healthy. And if we do get a rise in rates and a, a pullback in the S&P 500, in the NASDAQ, in indices, in stocks, in whatever, that should just be a dip buying opportunity because by the data, looking at this, the economy is very, very strong. Now, looking at the April seasonal performance chart, I showed you guys this yesterday. Now, we do normally expect quite a bullish April, but the first two to three days of April can actually be fairly sideways can be muted. There's not much price action that can happen in those few days. So if we do see down or sideways action in April here in the next couple of days, even for this week, completely normal. We normally do see quite a ramp up here at this point in April. And then again here at tax day all the way to OPEX where we then normally travel sideways for the rest of the month. So right now we're traveling well within seasonality and you know, the market's doing what the market normally does. Looking at gamma, literally nothing has changed since yesterday. The call gamma resistance is still at 5300 right here and the gamma flip at 5200. If we do get below here, it can get a bit ugly. A lot of the positive gamma support we did have here at the 5200 strike is fading. So if we do get to the strike, there's a tiny bit of support, but below 5200, we can see downside risk. That being said, we are in positive gamma. So buy dips, sell rips all the way to 5300 and this should be looked as a dip buying opportunity. Obviously everything changes below the 5200 strike, but as it is right now, positive gamma, buy dips, sell rips, nothing has fundamentally changed in this market. Now looking at the core market model, guys, we are in overbought territory and this is not a sell signal. This is literally the opposite. It's actually a reason to be quite bullish. We can look at short term sales when we do get to this extreme overbought area. However, in this overbought area and above the zero line, you want to hold equities, you want to hold risk assets and you want to favor the long side. Now looking at the equal weight magnificent seven index. Now people say this is the fab four, but Google's at all time high it broke out yesterday up 3%. The only ones not performing here is Apple and Tesla. The rest of this index is still moving higher and to see Apple and Tesla not putting work and still reach all time highs in this index is kind of crazy. Now we are starting to see a little bit of a turn here. However, that's just what the market does and to see Apple and Tesla not perform and this still move higher throughout the month of March is actually kind of crazy and very, very bullish. And it just goes to show the strength of these other names, particularly Nvidia. Now looking at the Fed financial stress index, now very cool indicator here. Levels below zero indicate less financial market stress. The normal levels above indicate more market financial stress. And it pretty much it's, cal it's constructed from 18 weekly data points, uh, seven interest rate series, six yield curve spreads, and then five other indicators. And pretty much this is telling us there's not a lot of stress in the financial market right now. We're looking at the same levels we were a year in 2020, 2016, 2014, 2012. And these were great times to hold equities, particularly here, 2004, five, six, and seven leading up to the GFC, a great time for equities, a really good time to hold risk on assets. And we're approaching the same levels here right now. So it is a time to be bullish. It is a time to be long because financial conditions are quite easy. Now looking at the risk on risk off indicator, and we are still in a risk on environment. These are the instruments for risk on these for risk off. You can see we used resistance here, 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 resistance turns support, and we are now in a risk on steadily upward trending environment. We can probably start getting a bit worried if we get below this line right here. And really if we break below this, but as it is right now, we are in a risk on environment and that means hold risk on assets, hold equities. Now looking at some financial market indicators, this is the AAA corporate bond and US treasury bond, the spread. You can see spreads are sitting very low levels, 0.6.7%. So the market is not stressed at all. The market is not showing us any signs of, the bond market is not showing us any signs of stress. We can also see the same is true here for BAA corporate bonds, which is pretty much junk bonds. And again, very, very tight spread. Some of the tightest we've ever had in a very, very long while, you know, going back to like 2007, the market's just not stressed. The market's not worried. They don't demand a high risk premium for holding these bonds right now. And any dips we do get in the equity market, you want to buy those dips looking for higher price action until spreads move materially higher above 2%, particularly for this index right here. Now looking at data in the week ahead, we got jolts today, but we got ADP employment tomorrow, initial jobless claims, 
And then we have the big one, the NFP and unemployment reports here on the fifth private payrolls unemployment rate. Now just diving into this, BOFA is expecting a 200,000 handle in non-farms, 216 is the consensus. Previously it was 275, private payrolls of 150, this is the BOFA consensus. By the way, the unemployment rate at 3.9%, consensus expect 3.8, very weird, we'll see which one of those is correct. Average hourly earnings month over month, an increase of 0.3%, and then weekly hours, pretty much the same as it was last month but we do expect 34.4 percent however if you've made it up until here thank you so much for watching if you like this video please subscribe hit that notification bell like this video and leave a comment for the algorithm cheers